Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much. Welcome back to American University's spring semester and the 27th Ann Farron. I met Ann Farron once. I didn't even know she was a real person. And I was really surprised she was still alive. I'd never heard of a conference <laughs> where the person was still alive. And she's delightful, as probably most of you know. Uh, thank you for coming. When we talked about putting something together, our main idea was what are students saying about their online courses? We were just talking, everybody's taken a class, so we think we all know how to be good teachers. But ironically, a lot, at this moment, we're in a little bit of a generational shift where a lot of online instructors didn't grow up with or maybe have never even taken a single online course. And so we're curious in, so we follow the, the sets and we go through the great training that CTRL has and, and we go out on our own and we read and we learn and maybe we've taken an online course to get the student perspective from that side. But really, what are the students saying about the online courses? And so this was the idea. Uh, um, delighted that we have together some terrific people. Uh, <coughs> Melissa Young teaches writing online and other things. And we have two American University <coughs> undergrads um, my favorite new American University program that I didn't even know existed until a few weeks ago. Uh, Sarah McKinley just completed her first semester of college in Greece through American University, including an online course. Did I say that all correctly? I didn't get to go to Greece, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Chandler Randall is a sophomore slash junior here in SPA. And so they're going to have, they're going to add their perspectives as well. Um, if you just scroll down here one second, space bar, right? Yep, that's it. Magic. Uh, so very easy. What are the students saying for exactly for the purpose of so we can make our courses better? We can understand what they're talking about so we can make our courses better. Um, we'll just go down the line. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the summer data from last year, uh, the online course evaluations, and then... Uh, Melissa will talk about one of the big things that we don't measure in these course evaluations, but that's really crucial, all of us know, is how to build a good online community, a good online learning community, when the students are in different time zones and different places and different purposes, and we don't get to see them. And then we'll have our students uh, talk about their own perspectives. Easy. Some of the things that students say in their course evaluations shouldn't be surprising to us. Um, students want good activities. Great. What does that mean? That's a different question. Students want good instructor feedback. And this was one of the things that we saw uh, very strong in the data, but also we did a couple dozen interviews with various online students at American University and elsewhere, and the ability to access their, their instructor was important all the time. But it turns out that if you run the data in, in certain ways at least, good activities and good feedback are necessary but not sufficient. So you find in the classes that don't get very high course evaluations that these are the complaints, that the activities and the feedback are complaints. But in the courses that are really good, sometimes you also get, well, the feedback was okay or the activities weren't great, but they still like the class. So we kind of have to tease that out a little bit. Class size matters, and we have questions about the response rates overall. I'll just go through each of these very quickly. Um, as you, yes? Did you not give us that question at the very early? Uh, which? Sarah? Your friend? So when you say class size matters, does, does the small is good, large is good? I'll get right to that. Oh, sorry. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. Nope, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, The most central part is, or, or the most central relationship is that students who said the instructor was good said the course was really good, and students that said the instructor was bad said the course was not very good. Uh, this was, you can see, uh, the relationship was, was very close, and that makes sense um, in, in almost any class, right? But it wasn't the idea that there were a lot of, well, I didn't like the instructor, but I love the course, or I love the instructor, but I didn't like the course. We, we just don't see that. Uh, instructor feedback we talked about, and we talked about the difference that um, 
you can have good courses, uh, although you have the feedback. It's, you know, it's kind of the data is a little bit all over the place on there. Um, but in the courses with lower course evaluations, the relationship is a little better, just like we described. Um, and the same with activities. I really like the activities. I may or may not like the course. But I didn't like the activities. I definitely don't like the course. Class size. You asked about class size. Class size doesn't seem to matter if you look at the whole universe. What I did was I looked at the SETs for the 80 undergraduate courses last summer. But if you pull them apart a little bit. Oops, did I go backwards one second? I'm sorry. Did I hit it twice? How do I go back? If you pull them apart, you can definitely see that there's a sweet spot, that the highest course evaluations had between 8 and 10 students. It was actually really between 6 and 10 students, except 7 was a little bit of an anomaly that I can't explain. People didn't like 7. Um, and, you know, that could just be a strange thing from one summer. But course evaluations that were over 6 were um, from students that were 8 to 10. And you can see that... There were, uh, there were just a couple of the bigger classes, I'm sorry, the bigger classes had slightly lower, but also the smaller classes. If you had four or five students, a lot of those courses had smaller, and, and I think a lot of that's going to have to do with your community, right? It's tough to build that kind of community, maybe. The same thing, I just did the class size groupings differently, uh, just to make sure, and you can see the same kinds of relationships. Um, Jim, can I ask you a question? Is this students that filled out the final evaluation or enrolled students? How do you measure class size? Enrolled students. We'll talk about mm -hmm. response rate in just a second. <laughs> yes. So this is of all enrolled students is the class size, class size 8, okay. class size 10. But <laughs> you, you segue very well. No one does this. All right. Um, fully a third, more than a third of the class had only one or two people fill out the response. And um, almost all the classes had less than a third of the people. Um, even three quarters had less than a quarter of the students fill out. So if you have 10 students in your class, but only one or two or three responses, you know, how does that work? And so when I asked, is that related to how happy you are with the course? That didn't seem to show up either. People, you know, if, if the course evaluations were high, that didn't mean there were a lot or, or a few students who responded. And if there were a lot or a few students who responded, that didn't seem to indicate that the grades were particularly high or particularly low. So when we did all the data, those are the things that come through. But then we also did um, between 25 and 30 interviews of students who've taken online courses here and other places. And they had some things that I think you'll find familiar, but a couple I thought are really interesting. One is they do it for convenience. We know this. This is great. Um, but I also like that a few students noted that in the classroom, if I pick on you right now, you don't really have time to formulate your thought. But in an online class, you do. You can say, oh, that's a really good question. You don't have to answer it right now. All right? Um, the accessibility was so important that a large number of the people we talked to said, I'd really like for there to be a mandatory one-on-one -on -one video chat with the instructor early in the class. We want office hours, was, one of the, was some of the feedback. And also, we'd really like to meet with the group once. Uh, my online courses are asynchronous, and I think a lot of um, courses here are asynchronous. And a lot of students mentioned, we'd like to all be together once, even if it's only online. And I thought that was pretty interesting feedback. Um, they all mentioned how important it is to have a great learning community. And this is exactly what Melissa is going to talk about. So we'll leave that aside for one second. Um, they really liked if you introduced the class on a short video for five, six minutes, really introduce the class and say, this is what we're doing this week. This is how it fits into where we are in the course. These are how the pieces of this week fit together. They want that explanatory time period of you talking to them about what we're doing this week. They don't want... 40 minutes of you standing up and being really smart and then falling asleep in front of their computer screens while they're going to get coffee and, and other things. Uh, there was one, uh, one piece of research I found a couple of years ago that said 
If you give students a 42 minute video, there's no chance they'll watch it. They'll watch about five minutes. Yeah. But if you give them, I think you showed me this article. Um, if you show them six seven minute videos, they'll watch them. Um, so, so this was part of the question. Uh, if they don't understand why they have an online course and just a book, and that you're not using online resources. Uh, they, they don't understand that. They expect not only for the instruction to be online, but to use online resources. Uh, they like to speed the video up to one and a half and transcripts, and I think that's all. <laughs> they need an online hallway. So that's my goal for this summer is to create an online hallway. They want somewhere they can chat with each other after class without me being there. They want to talk about the questions in class and these kinds of things. I thought that was great. Um, in the process of building an online community, though, it can't be forced. And sometimes it doesn't work, and, and not everything works. So more than one said group projects are torture. And I thought that was really uh, that, they, uh, that multiple students used the same word torture. I was like, well, I don't assign group projects, so it's not me. Uh, but I thought that was really interesting. Um, and in the discussions, they feel like after the first two people have spoken, there's, well, everything's already been said. The first two or three people said things. I don't want to just repeat them. Um, again, with the accessibility, they have a question after class. They want to come up after class and ask you a quick question. But they can't do that, right? They need you to be responsive to them, whether it's by email or Facebook message or however you do it. Um, they just have one quick question, and they need you to be there for that. Uh, and also the bigger questions. How am I doing in class? Am I getting enough feedback? Are, are, my, are my grades good? Are my essays good? If you're not turning that back, uh, they notice. Uh, some web pages are really good. Some aren't. Um, use online sources. And I love this one from a former student of mine who's a lawyer now. Yeah. She has a preference for a few high-point deliverables in a classroom format over the many low-point deliverables typical of online courses. I was like, well, thank you for caring enough about me to have such a thoughtful response. But I did think that's funny. Instead of a few tests or a few papers or, or something like this, we have such a compressed time schedule and we use such different, uh, sometimes we use different grading measures um, that, th that that was a good insight. Okay. Uh, one thing we don't ask on the SETs, either in online courses or in classroom courses, is how was your online, I mean, how was your learning community? Right? How was the classroom setting? What was the spirit of the classroom um, online or in the classroom? We don't ask that, um, but Melissa's going to tell us all about how to be great at that. Okay. Yeah? Great. Can you, you hear me from here? You tell me when you want those pictures. Okay. It will be. Thank you. Yeah. So I just wanted to share a few ideas about building community in the classroom. And I don't think it's all that different than building a community in a traditional classroom here at AU. But I do know that it's twice the work. Um, it was different for Sarah's class in Greece because they were already, they were already there in a community together. Um, they were all sitting in a lab together at the university without me. And that was a new experience for me. When I teach online at AU, it's normally during the summer, and students are like yours, Jim, they're all over the world. And so building the community is a different task when they are so spread out. This was different because they already had a community, and I was the outsider coming into that community. Um, and you could tell that from the discussion, you could tell that they knew each other well, um, that um, my job was more as moderator among them. The first thing is that they don't know how to teach, they don't know how to take an online class. AU students aren't typically in online classes, and I would say 99% of the students I've taught at AU have never taken an online class. And so we assume that they are versed in the technology, um, we assume that they know how to take an online class, and there really is a week of orientation where you are teaching them what you expect out of them. And when, I, when I've been in classes and I haven't had that week of orientation, um, if it's a seven-week summer class, it has to go much quicker. We really do hit the ground running. This was a 12-week class, and like I said, they already had a community that, they were, that was established, and I was stepping into that community. But we assume 
our young freshmen know how to Skype. We assume they know how to tweet. We assume they're on Facebook. We assume they know how to use Blackboard. And in their social life, they do. But in an academic life, they do not. Um, and that is, um, there's a learning curve there, teaching them what's expected of them. I have found that sometimes I switch platforms according to where they are. The class that Sarah was in, everyone was on Facebook. Everyone was pretty versed in Facebook. So that's what I used for our community building. I still use Blackboard um, for our threaded discussions, for our more formal assignments, for peer review. But Facebook was really where the community interacted in a much more casual way, giving each other feedback on topics. And I was able to bring in um, our librarian, Rachel Borchart here at AU, into the online class for the students in Greece so that she could give them feedback and she could be a part of that community. Um, let me show you one of the screenshots. It might be with Sarah in oh, it. I have it on my screen. Okay. I don't so know how to, how do I, it's on my computer screen. I don't know why it's not on the big screen. Click exit. Click what? To what? Exit. Oh, to mine? Is it from what? There you go. Okay. So this is just, this is Kathleen's. Um, this is a post. Uh, from October of last year, the beginning of the research project, I simply asked them to share what their topic was in a very, very casual, most importantly, ungraded platform. So what are you thinking about writing? Um, they had an experience called an outsider research experience, something to do with their program in Greece, something they'd experienced. It was easy. They're in Greece for the first time. Everything they were experiencing was outside of their comfort zone. But in the normal AU classroom, in the traditional classroom, students will go out into the DC community. They'll do something, or on campus, something they haven't done before, anything. And I asked them simply to post what their experience was and give a little bit of uh, feedback on what they were thinking about writing about. This is early in the research process where they just have an idea. They don't even have a formulated research question yet. They're not really sure where to start. Um, but part of my job and Rachel's job is to teach them how to do research through the AU library when they're not at AU. So how do you access, most of our students here at AU, of course, use the AU library and they're not at AU. They may be physically sitting in that building over there, but they're really just doing online learning the same you know, as a research project. So this was early in the semester and I asked them very casually just to post what they were thinking about writing about. Um, and then you'll see my response, another classmate, and the requirement was post your topic and respond to someone else's very, very um, open-ended, right? And again, this is an ungraded assignment, and I find that the best way to build a community in the online environment is when it's ungraded, when it's more casual, when you're free simply to throw your ideas out there and get feedback on them, rather than feel that I'm grading everything, right, or you're being assessed on everything. So I asked them to post their topics, gave them some feedback, another classmate posted back as well, um, and then Rachel's our librarian, and she jumps in and reiterates the direction that she thinks Kathleen should go with her research. Um, and this helps teach them how to begin talking about their research topics in an academic way, right? And where do you go for the databases? This um, is something I do in my traditional classroom as well. I use Facebook groups the exact same way in, as I do in my online classroom. Um, and then would you show the other one? I think the other one is Sarah. Uh, now Sarah, you could jump in here and tell how many times we had Skyped behind the scenes talking about this topic, mm -hmm. um, formulating it before you actually were comfortable posting it here. Yeah, I was a, I was a little lost in terms of what my research question was going to be, how to word it right, how to make it argumentative rather than just, you know, it, rather than just one particular statement that I could argue about for forever. Um, that was kind of one-sided. So. Um, yeah, there were, there were a lot of different steps. The Facebook process was very helpful in that, you know, when we were, we were all living together and no one really wanted to talk about uh, our research question casually. Over <laughs> the, the, yeah, right. the, the, Facebook, uh, the Facebook post really helped us think out what we were going to do um, in a more casual but also academic sense. I also like that it allowed for everyone to see what each other was doing, mm -hmm. so they could start seeing how the experience led to a topic, which led to a research question, which two months later led to an argument. 
um, getting them to move through that process is, is a, it, that's my challenge. That's why I teach college writing. Um, but Sarah took the assignment, um, as all our really, really great students do, and immediately thought about it differently. And most of the students were looking at um, an experience they had in Greece, but Sarah was thinking about how the entire experience as a first generation college student was outside of the comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, and so this opened up a really, really interesting topic and a, and a great conversation for the entire community. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see Rachel jumping in. And this is the very first set of posts about their topic a month later. I then had them post their formal research questions so they could see how they moved from idea to topic to research question. And we did another round where Rachel um, also jumped in and, and is targeted their research in a much more productive way. So help and really help them get unstuck. I think that's part of what you mentioned about how they have questions after class and they can't stop you in the hallway. Um, I find that Facebook is where they will post um, and I, in a class a year ago, really everyone was on Twitter, so I used a tweet deck for the exact same purpose. It works the same as Facebook um, for them interacting with each other, them posting questions at 4 a.m. that I'm not available to answer, but they are. Um, I did find with the Greece students that I had to rearrange my, <laughs> my office hours. My office hours began Friday at 7 a.m. Uh, because that's when they were in the lab and had a reliable internet connection. So there was a learning curve, I think, for all of us <laughs> this semester. Um, but you might want to talk about what you found useful in the class and then what perhaps activities are not useful. They want to hear that from you, not us. <laughs> we think everything we do is useful <laughs> and successful in the classroom. Well, um, would you mind if I go first? Or, okay. um, well, I think uh, particularly with the research questions, Professor Young did a very good job in helping us sort out things both on uh, both online and through Skype sessions where we could all just kind of uh, perfect our ideas on a more personal level. Um, and so the discussions both on Facebook and on Blackboard were helpful as we got the hang of Blackboard. Um, Blackboard has a real learning curve. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Blackboard is where the graded discussions happen. Um, Everything I use Facebook for or Twitter or Skype is a completely ungraded platform. Um, one thing was that there were no, like, vi it, there was nothing visual, really. It was all very um, written down, and that was fine for me, but I think a few people were more, uh, they were better at absorbing information when they could hear it. So um, that would have, helped for certain students, but um, yeah, I, and you know, as always, when you're teaching primarily, or when you're teaching and learning through like primarily written things, tone can be misinterpreted, There, people can misconstrue certain ideas, but um, I think for the most part, uh, we had a very unique learning experience. Again, we were all living with each other. We all knew each other on a very personal basis, and group projects were not quite the same because at dinner we could be like, can you edit my paper? And, uh, you know, since we knew each other, again, people could come up to others, maybe not even specifically in their group, and say, can you look at my paper or, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so that was, that was primarily it. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Chandler. Um, so I've taken several online classes here at AU. Um, only in the summer, so I think that's important to know. But I think there's generally three things that students really look for, um, and, and not just online classrooms, but classrooms in general. And I think that's a connection with their professor, with students, and also the material. Um, and definitely in an online plat platform that's, that changes a bit because you don't have a real atmosphere to connect with students or connect with professors. So you have to make an artificial one. And I think th that's really the emphasis that I think should be, should be placed on these um, <coughs> online material is to how to, to make it feel real, to make it feel not online, to make it feel like you're actually in the classroom with these students. Um, so, so for instance, I think one thing that's so important um, for, for the student, is, for me especially, is getting to know that professor. Um, I plan on going to law school eventually, so you know that connection's important for maybe a letter of recommendation or, or research or, or something like that. Um, but 
Then the question is, how do you actually do that? Because you're not there with them. So I, I mean, the internet has so many options to do that now, especially with Skype or FaceTime or, or Facebook even. They have a video section now. So I think that's really important, is having some, at least one opportunity to meet face to face, or however you want to call that, screen to screen. Um, really anything that, that allows the student to get to know the professor more than just in a professor, you know, more than just a student professor. So just actually get to know them. Um, second, I think that the connection with students is so important because I can learn a lot from a professor, but I can almost learn more from a friend in that classroom. If I have a question about, you know, what, I don't know, what's, what's something in the material and I'm completely lost, I can go to that friend. And I think that's really important. So somehow find a way to facilitate ways for students to connect, whether that's mandatory Facebook posts that they have to respond on, or what um, Professor Court did was he had a website and we had to write short essays, you know, 500 words about um, different chapters, and we could pick from several different topics, and then we had to comment on two of those. And I thought that was an, a great way, because I got to meet new Comment people. on two other students. Right, right. So I, I had to force myself to meet people that I wouldn't necessarily know, because in that particular class, I only knew one other person beforehand. Um, so I got to meet student, students online, and that was a really cool way to meet people. It's, it's not traditional whatsoever. Um, and then most uniquely is connecting with that material. Um, as a college student, it's important to do more than just, you know, read, take a lecture and then try and take a test. I think we all know that you're not going to do very well if you just do that. Um, so I think one thing that's really important is to do more than just posting lectures online. I, I think it's really important maybe to do video lectures that are six, seven minutes long in, in different parts. And that was something that Professor Quirk brought up earlier. I think that's really important because not having the traditional classroom, it can be really boring to just sit there for 40 minutes and watch a lecture, whether it's you speaking or uh, some other video. But it's really nice when you have, you know. Not, not these instructors, they give great 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. But in general, like five to six minute videos, I, that's something I can really tolerate and really plan throughout my day or my week. If I have a busy schedule, if I'm interning during the summer or or some other thing maybe during the year. And can I ask a question? Is having those on Facebook useful or would you rather have them somewhere else? Honestly, I, I don't think it matters too much where it is as long as it's pretty accessible. Um, personally, I think Facebook's great. I know for other students, as they, they do have issues with Facebook because it's like Facebook's their happy, free, away from school <laughs> place and then it gets distorted yeah, to this, yeah. oh no, I have to do work on here. Um, well, and I want to be clear, these are Facebook groups Right. We're not friends. That's right. 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 And so right. There, there really is a separation of yeah, there church absolutely and state, is. as there, there should be. <laughs> right. you, know, you don't have to friend in any way in order to no. be in a member of a group. Right. And, uh, and also, sorry for interrupting both oh, no. of you. It's a great opportunity to remind your students and incentivize your students um, to check their privacy settings. Mm -hmm. You say, hey, you know, what's your public profile? Because I can see your public profile. Um, so, you know, check that out. We, we actually, true. I turned it into an exercise that I didn't intend. When the students first arrived in Greece, one of the first questions was, what rhetorical argument? So I was just trying to introduce the language of argument. What rhetorical argument are you making with your Facebook profile? And every one of the students was very professional. I am, I know how to do this. I know what you're saying, Professor Young. And then I mentioned that eight out of 10 were bikini shots <laughs> from their first week in Greece because they're in Greece and they're having a ball and they're lovely and wonderful and having fun. But that is the icon that was showing up every time they posted to our class. Um, <laughs> and and I, I wasn't willing to join them where they were in that moment, but it became a good teachable moment. I was not one of the ones with the no, bikini. Not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think just util utilizing that online ability is so important because there's so much out there. Because YouTube videos are great, and I think they should definitely be utilized. I think we just need to be more conscious of how it's being used. And definitely shorter videos are better, but that's not to say that long videos aren't important. And transcripts do help, and I, I think that's my last, my last point. What helps? Uh, transcripts. Oh, the, the, uh, the, uh, I'm just curious, when you say YouTube videos, are you saying ones that the professor made, that you made, or independent things that are resources for people to watch? Honestly, all three. I think all three are really important. The handbook that we use in the college writing program is by Andrea Lunsford, and it's customized to AU. And it's the handbook that all of our freshmen get in the college writing program. They use throughout their four years here. Um, and 
the Student Free Greek has the handbook as well. And Andrea Lunsford, the um, author of the handbook, has created her own set of videos that go with each of the chapters. She's not the most dynamic <laughs> presenter, but they are four to six minute clips that talk about conclusions or how do you, you know, develop an argument, how do you create pathos within it. So they are digestible, small ones. And uh, if I may, uh, one thing that was also pretty unique about our situation in Greece was that we had a shuttle that took us to and from campus, and there was certain structure. We had two hours after our last class ended, and we went in on Wednesday for two hours when we didn't have any classes. And that kind of allowed for a certain structure uh, for us to put aside for the online class that I don't know that a lot of students have, you know, it's kind of like go as you have time. And uh, it w that was extremely helpful that we did that. I had to adjust my teaching though because I've never had an online class that was online together somewhere else during such a structured period. And so I knew when they would be in that lab that I would really be doing all my teaching um, because that's when they were going over the agenda for the week, that's when they were posting most of the discussion. Um, and I had to adapt my own schedule to that because uh, that's when they were available. <coughs> and normally in an online class, um, it's really asynchronous and there's not that structured time. Mm -hmm. We also had to adjust to when you could get internet though. Mm -hmm. And we <laughs> would uh, Skype sometimes and I would have to say, okay, on the third floor in Kathleen's room, there's a good <laughs> connection. So I need you, Ethan, to take your computer up to Kathleen's room on the third floor because there seems to be internet right now. <laughs> <laughs> you both funny. identify something that a lot of people talked about uh, when we were asking them, and that was, especially if it's a student's first online course, it's new for them in terms of creating the time and the space and where am I going to do this and when am I going to do this. Well, I have something else to do right now, so I'll do it later. Uh, not having that strict, I have to be at class at 1015, it's really a, another student obligation is to build that self-discipline to right. when am I going to do this work. Some of it you can do at the bus stop, yeah. right? But yeah. not all of it. <laughs> yeah, an essay, 500 word essay is definitely not easy to do at the bus stop on your phone. Oh, that's right. But you can keep up on everybody's, uh, in, in our classes, we also have post current events. And mm. um, you can look at what everybody's current event is on Facebook while right. you're at the bus stop. Right. Um, but, but not compose, you know, yeah. Aristotelian theology. Yeah, that, that takes a laptop to do. Yeah, it's a little easier. Well, and the Blackboard app is so much better at AU yes. now than it was three years ago, right? five years ago. Um, I, I don't think students can still take their entire online class on their phone. They think they can. <laughs> but um, the Blackboard app has really, um, yeah. they've responded to the feedback that students have given them about what works and what doesn't. Oh, yeah. that's good. I, I use the, the, the Blackboard, Blackboard app a lot, mm -hmm. actually. Oh, that's it's really great. great. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Why did you folks feel it was necessary to go outside of the LMS and the, the platforms that AU is providing? Is it the familiarity of these uh, young folks with Facebook and, and Twitter and Skype? Or was it the fact that the discussion questions in Blackboard are a little uh, uh, difficult in, in terms of actually uh, the interface and, and the discussion? I'm just curious why these other platforms, and, and why also they weren't incorporated into Blackboard. I do use Blackboard for my graded discussions, and they are as vibrant and as active um, as our Facebook were. Um, I think it's a matter of meeting them where they are, but I also think in a traditional classroom, I'm also meeting them outside of office hours, I'm meeting them in my office, I'm meeting them through email, I'm meeting them. We already use a lot of different platforms besides just the traditional classroom. So I think of Blackboard as my traditional classroom, and I think of those other platforms as the other spaces I would normally meet students. And mine, mine was a little different. I used Facebook for exactly the reason Chandler protested, and that's because that's where they are. And so we do our less rigorous work on Facebook where people are, and also that's where each of us can post, hey, such and such office is looking for interns applications, mm -hmm. or there's a job opening here. These, so we also have that kind of community building, if, if that's an 80s word we can use. Um, but I built my own little tiny WordPress page instead of Blackboard for ease of use for me and for students. Um, I did this. I, I find it easier. A lot of my students say they find it easier. Maybe some other people prefer Blackboard. But for me, it was easier just to do that short WordPress page. 
I use Blackboard for all the official things. So the syllabus is in there, um, any required readings, especially, uh, you know, I, just, I, I can't just post the chapter of a book up on Facebook or, what, you know, an article, uh, those kinds of things. So all that for, and the grading, I, I'll do on Blackboard. So all the formal <laughs> things only, but not the work. Another thing that's helpful in the Facebook versus Blackboard thing is that when you're on Facebook, you get a message that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that someone posted to the group, someone replied to your comment. I really wish Blackboard would tell us when somebody replied yeah, to really one of yeah. our discussions. That's really great. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that, that you get a notification? Yeah, the subscribe button. Yeah. <laughs> You can't subscribe. I actually knew that. do know that and don't want them to because I feel that a big part of the learning in our Blackboard discussion is them reading each other's discussions and not just listening to what other people say in response to theirs. And so I do know about that button and I hide it on my Blackboard page. <laughs> well, one thing about that was that, you know, having us respond, having it mandatory that we respond to other people's discuss. I think that that kind of like, that, 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 that helped with being able to read other people's. Because um, you had to. Yeah. Right. Where early on in the course, what happens is they just talk to me. The very first week, all the discussions start flowing through me. So I'm doing 17 posts in two different threaded discussions every day until I teach them that you can earn as many points in the discussion by interacting with other students. And, and then I start um, rewarding the discussion posts that go beyond the topic or post an outside link or ask another question. And we talk a lot about how asking questions is as important as talking in the discussion itself. And that's true in a traditional classroom or in the online environment. But it does take until about week two of the online class for students to start interacting with each other in Blackboard rather than just filtering through me. Um, but it's something I think we have to teach them if that's what our expectation is. And I wonder if there's a difference. Do you teach primarily freshmen? Yes. And so I teach very often upperclassmen who maybe have taken an online class before, but certainly have sat in college classrooms lots of times and have some different sense. So I wonder if there's a difference. Yeah. I, would, I would assume so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tamara, you mentioned that transcripts of videos were helpful, and I wonder if you meant like those kind of four to six minute videos that instructors post, and if so, have you guys done transcripts of videos, and how did you I usually put up uh, PowerPoint notes that are much more detailed than my six minute video. Okay. So I'll have typically any segment that we're talking about <coughs> will have academic readings and video. It might be the author talking about the book, it might be an unrelated, you know, it might be something else. Um, and a PowerPoint and my introductory video, my short introductory video. And in theory, those pieces work together, you know, they're, they're sewn together neatly, more or less, most of the time. Um, so I don't do formal transcripts, but instead PowerPoints that will go along with all three of those pieces together. And, and by that, I, all I meant was more on long videos. Um, for four or five minute video, I think it's not unreasonable to ask somebody to, to sit there and watch, watch that. But for like a TED Talk that's an hour and a half, if, if there is one that long, yeah. something like that. Um, just because you can read it so much faster than talking. I agree. I like transcripts. I yeah. think transcripts are great in your program. And so you're yeah. saying mm -hmm. a lot. So I'm just curious if you teach that. Yeah. I think the transcripts, well, in a, even a traditional classroom, are really necessary, especially for ESL learners. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, because everything in a traditional classroom that I say is also in some written format. Right. And that's true of whether it's an ESL student or just a student who learns that way. I learn best through text. Sarah learns best through text. So an online class that's text-based is going to be more successful, but another student might need um, more Skype sessions individually. Um, and I think that's the surprising part about teaching writing online. Jim mentioned at the beginning that it, you don't want the class to be one-on-one, -on -one, but when you're teaching writing, it really is one-on-one, -on -one, and that's an enormous amount. I Skype with them for about an hour on every single draft, and that's just how you have to teach writing. <coughs> Not, I can do a lecture on conclusions or best practices for introductions or research skills. Those are general topics. But really when it gets into working with a student one-on-one -on -one and 
and watching a draft develop over three months, that requires a Skype session. Who makes the transcript? No one. There is no transcript <laughs> of a Skype session. No, but I mean, it'll be the ones where you have transcripts. Who, who makes them? I don't think we do. I think Google's actually producing a program that does it for you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how accurate it is, <laughs> but. I will say that anything I would be doing in a video is somewhere else in my Blackboard already. It's really just delivering it, the exact same information in another platform, but I don't have transcripts of those. Do you have questions? Yes, actually, I am, uh, my question is uh, interested to Sarah and Sandra. Uh, is your online experience is, is limited to literature and government? Have you taken courses at Godard, for example? Uh, well, it was just my first semester, so yeah. uh, I only had one online course while I was in Greece, but I was taking other classes in person. No, so. because my, my point is very simple, that, that I, I, I hope when you are listening to all these experiences, you are differentiating among disciplines, because, for example, when I teach at Godard, my course in terms of content, in terms of intensity, is quite different from other courses. So consequently, the component of the course, uh, especially, uh, Jim, what you mentioned about the size, I taught more than 40 courses online so far. And I'll tell you frankly, uh, if we are talking about an, an, a, a highly rigorous course and uh, where there is uh, interaction, where as at least if you are talking about the summer courses, uh, for example, in my courses, if each student would get <coughs> at least at least 14 uh, uh, grades, right. and in the winter he will get 23, 23, 24 grades. Right. So when you tell me that size doesn't matter, I am going to tell you, without having scientific uh, uh, data, this is absolutely a suicide. No, that's what we found was the smaller no, no, I, classes. I mean, to me, after all these 40 courses, I'm very passionate about the size of the classes. Did Either we are going to teach online and students benefit, or we are going just to teach on, online. To me, more than 20, 25 students is absolutely useless yeah. exercise. What size did you find most effective? Actually, 20, 20 is, is, is perfect, especially when I hear day in and day out, give me a feedback. Yeah. Well, for God's sake, if I have 20, if I have 35 students, I have a, every week I have discussion board, and every week I have written assignment I'm going to read and write and comment and what have you, what do you think I'm going to do? Right. Spend six hours a day <coughs> providing feedback to students? Are you right. kidding me? Right. Those are large classes, right. yeah, but uh, I mean, ours but, are much smaller. Um, and yeah, we saw the same thing, 17 to 20, much higher than 21 and up, and 14 to 19, much higher than 20 and up. So it's exactly what you said. Plus, I think Melissa, <coughs> what, what, what she mentioned about, uh, I'm very surprised because I was a member of the um, uh, online uh, advocacy group at AJU for about five years. We always learned that students, before they take an online course, he must complete a training course before he takes a course online. So I'm very surprised that students are taking courses without experience in online do you teaching. Mean, do you mean the instructors? Uh, AU instructors have to be certified. Well, by students as, as well. One thing I find when I teach a traditional class, if I have students going to too many places, it gets confusing. So like something's on Blackboard, and then like something's on the Twitter thing, and blah, blah, blah. So what have you found to be a really useful way for uh, online, uh, when I can't say go here now, uh, to keep all that together so that it seems not confusing and kind of unified? Like what's worked for you folks? So, um, so for me, that's a very good point, actually. Um, yeah, if you're going to like 15 different places, it's, it gets really confusing. I'm like, I'm not, I'm, not so, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to post here today or tomorrow. Um, so I don't, I don't know about exact, you know, whether you should have used Facebook or Blackboard, but I think, you know, no less than five, or no, no more than five, I think is a good, reasonable amount. I, I think 
this summer we probably used we used four. Three. Well, we used two. We used Facebook and um, and the WordPress. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then you know other other websites like news sites or things that you want to check regularly. And what I, I I tend to um, have the same information as multiple places. That's just okay. what I regularly. If it's a Blackboard announcement, it's going to come to your email, and I'm also going to post it to Facebook. Okay. Right. Absolutely. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I I think I have um I may be unique. I have a very I'm a student. Um. I wasn't born in the. Facebook generation, obviously, um, and so it's all kind of new to me. I realize I'm an exception, and maybe I'm on my way out. You guys should be designing things for the people of the future, not for people like me. Um, I find that having one site and one site only, Blackboard Learn, I spent a lot of time learning how to use it. It works well. I'd like to find the the information is in that one place instead of it's in multiple places and I'm constantly going back and you know something's reworded slightly differently I'm wondering is that a duplicate assignment is that the same assignment is it something else one place I, it's like if you have a classroom a physical classroom it's on one floor it takes place at this time I show up there I'm not like well you went down to the lower floor and got that other page in that other place right <laughs> no I didn't I went to one place and that's where I want to have it at the same time. Uh, the other thing is I understand the convenience part, but I'm also, because I'm looking at teaching eventually, I'm sort of, uh, should I open up the can of worms? It's like, what is uh, uh, education devolving to? You know, Facebook, uh, I prefer to get my information in the bar, so why don't you teach me, you know, have some kind of or, or on ESPN, a little ticker running underneath so I can watch football and see what I'm supposed to learn but not be taken away from my football game. It's like, how about the education, if you just require the students to say, I'm sorry, you're going to have to shut Facebook off for a few minutes and go to this other place where you can learn. And when you want to go to Facebook, you know, you can multitask with that in another way. But I think the onus really is on them, especially in the online environment. Um, and I, that's why I asked Jim immediately about this, whether or not he was measuring the original enrollment versus how many students fill out the SVT. Because in my seven week summer class, which is an accelerated, they're doing the same amount of work. They're writing an entire 15 page, 20 source research paper in seven weeks. It's really, the, the success rate is not high. <laughs> And so I do end up with about a six to 10 person class in my summer class because students maybe overextend. They also took jobs, they took three online classes and their parents told them they had to. They may not be as equipped, right? The success rate in Sarah's class was very high because they were traditional freshmen in, a, in a, an environment that supported them. They had time that they had to work on it and it was a fantastic class. Usually in a summer seven week accelerated class, really if they're not motivated to come to Blackboard every single day and to make themselves you know, log into Blackboard every day, the success rate is not as high, unfortunately. Yeah. And I, I would say you're exactly right, that um, you need somewhere to do the, the WordPress or the Blackboard work and somewhere to watch your videos and do your readings. But at least my Facebook assignments are designed to, to do on the bus stop, to do waiting for the metro. You know, what are other people posting? If there's if four people have posted stories and one of them is really interesting to you, go click on that link and, and read that and, and have a comment or think about it later and come back and comment later. Specifically designed to be bite size, while the more traditional assignments are designed for more traditional assignments. Exactly like you said. Laura, good. Um, thank you all for doing such a wonderful presentation. I had a uh, question for the students and I hope Jim and Melissa don't get offended, but I wanted to know if there were one or two things that you wish your professors had done differently. Because the grades are in. Go for it. Go ahead. You, I got a thing. I got a thing too, honestly. Um, well, you mentioned you wanted more videos. Yeah, so yeah more videos more. I think uh, would be helpful, um, particularly from the professor themselves because it's more specific, you know, you know exactly what is being expected. The, the weekly 
syllabus that we got was very helpful because it laid things out. It was more like, you know, specific and everything like that. I really liked that as well. Um, so, yeah. And you've taken a lot of classes, so you can pretend it's not about them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think more more videos would be helpful. You, you certainly did a lot. Um, I th maybe even like longer videos, if, uh -huh. if that makes sense. Like more like movies or documentary styles than just maybe lect online lectures or something like that. Something that really connects the world with your classroom, I think would be really interesting because the internet has such an ability to do that. And I think that's something that can really just be expanded on. I know one thing I'd like is to have students produce some of that content as well. Yeah, that's true. As you can make an argument orally, you can, you know, and, and I tend to do everything in writing, but I think there are a lot of platforms I'm not taking advantage of yet where they could do that for us as well. Yeah, that's right. In, in my online class this fall, uh, students said, how come we have to write stuff? Mm -hmm. How come some of our short assignments we can't just submit mm -hmm. as video assignments like mm -hmm. we would in a classroom? Mm -hmm. You would ask me in a classroom a question, and I would respond like the, the same way. Um, we just have a couple more minutes. Maybe you have some more questions. Yeah. So, uh, I was inspired by your data analysis. And my question is about controlling for graduate versus undergraduate students. I and only did undergrad courses. Okay. But how about the data? I only chose the data from undergraduate courses. Okay. And how about, I'm sorry. You're fine. How about the controlling for, say, students who are hybrid programs versus online quality? It was all the ones, I chose the SETs from the link that said distance learning. So I don't know if that includes hybrid courses or not. But it was summer 2015 undergrads on the SETs page where it says, you know, these classes, these classes, and then it's got a separate link for distance learning. It was those undergrad classes from the summer. Um, I'm teaching now in the 2U program at the business school just started this year. So we have a mandatory face-to-face -face meeting two hours a week. So it feels like a class, other than a few technical snafus. I'm wondering if anybody in the room has experienced both the traditional AU online teaching and 2U and can contrast them. Yes. Okay, great. Comments? Uh, yeah, so I did a TU course in the summer for SIS, and I've done uh, Blackboard. I had 12 lectures for TU, TU. Four of them got cut off, so it was very stressful uh, because you're in a classroom with no students, and they're all waiting for you to solve this. <laughs> but putting that aside, I like the, asynchron the, the synchronous plus asynchronous more than everything asynchronous. points about, I, I don't know, losing that that interaction as much, I mean, I know there's more I need to learn, I do, as much as we try to get this in, in a asynchronous mode, the interaction, discussion threads, and everything else, I like that panel of 16 students, you know, you know and, and interact with them once a week. I like the asynchronous places plus synchronous. And our, our interviews showed that um, students like that too. Yeah. Austin gets the last comment. I like the fact that the class is captured between students, even though yeah. Yeah. this plus and minus for 15 is great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you especially to our students, and thank you all for coming.